You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. I want to remind you that we still have a free book offer from George Newberry. It's the book that everybody who invests in real estate must read called Burn Zones. And if you go to wealthformula.com, you can still click and get that book for a limited time. That will be delivered to your door. And also, if you are an accredited investor, want to get involved with some potential deals and deal flow, click on the accredited investor, invest with me, and we can talk on the phone about what your goals are, et cetera. I don't have any deals per se. That's not what this is all about. It's about creating a community of accredited investors. And I think that's really important for people who want to get involved with deal flow. You can also get there on the newsletter and ask me questions on Ask Buck. Now, listen, today's show is focusing again on real asset investing. Now, real asset investing is not limited to the rich, okay? That's something that I think a lot of people think, which is simply not the case. In fact, if you look at the crowdfunding movement on the internet now, you can now invest in just about anything you want. The crowdfunding laws that happened recently were really intended to rectify this sort of unfair advantage that it seemed like the affluent had to investments with greater profit potential. But don't forget, listen, the opportunities to invest in real assets were there long before this crowdfunding frenzy. And anyone who could afford it you know, could buy themselves a house and rent it out. I mean, you, you don't have to be an accredited investor for that. You just have to have some money. As you know, residential real estate is my favorite investing asset class. And the problem I think that most people have with this idea is they don't want to be landlords. You know, sure, that rental house might be a great investment and a good source of cash flow. But who wants to worry about tenants and toilets and termites and all that? Certainly not me. So, in fact, I mean, that's really one of the reasons why I chose apartment buildings instead. I felt that with economies of scale, et cetera, you could get better management and be hands off for larger assets. And and that has generally been the case. And I still believe that to be true. However, I've been talking a lot lately, more and more, to investors who've turned to turnkey models for investing in single family homes, of all things. And have had great success with this model. Now, you're probably, a lot of you listeners probably already do that, and they're like, yeah, Buck, tell me something I don't know. But a lot of people don't know about this, and frankly, I have avoided single-family houses because of a variety of reasons, you know, really stemming from the deployment of capital, how much you can deploy, and my concern again about, well, can you can you make a profit and still have somebody else, you know, manage these things and not be a landlord? Okay, but the people I'm talking to, they're people I trust, and they're claiming they're getting double-digit returns. And the idea is that this turnkey-type company not only provides you with deal flow, but it also helps you through the acquisition process, with contracts, due diligence, all the stuff that, especially if you're a first-time real estate buyer, you may not know a lot about. And they also hook you up with a quality property manager. Now, I have no experience with this model myself, but I wanted to learn more so that I could pass it on to you. So I contacted my friend who's a a trusted friend, I should say, an ethical guy, and he happens to be a fellow podcaster, Lane Kawaka of Simple Passive Cashflow. Now, Lane has become sort of the turnkey guy. Anyway, turns out that since I last talked to him about the turnkey stuff, he liked it so much that he actually got involved in the business with the guy in Alabama who he bought a bunch of houses from, a guy by the name of Jonathan Mednick. So in this episode of Wealth Formula Podcast, you're going to hear from both of those guys, and you're going to hear about turnkey investing, primarily in Alabama, in single-family houses, and if this is something that you should potentially consider. This is brand new for me, too. So we're going to be learning together and hopefully we can find something that uh, we we like and and look into a little further. And if not, we can cross it off our list. So when we come back, we'll have Lane Kawaka and Jonathan Mednick on the Wealth Formula podcast. (laughs) 
Are you ready for adventure and financial education? Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Join the Real Estate Guys radio show for the 15th annual Investor Summit. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, attorney Mauricio Raoul, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. And new for this year, come meet Buck Joffrey from the Wealth Formula podcast. Plus, joining us live and in person for his fifth Investor Summit, the incomparable Peter Schiff. Peter is one of the few people who called the mortgage meltdown in writing before it happened. So come and find out how you can be prepared for the next economic shift. It all begins April 1st in Houston, Texas. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click on the tab that says Summit to learn more. Or call 888-GUYS-RADIO to talk with our Summit specialist. Spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Buck Joffrey, and an all-star faculty in the 15th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. Lane, welcome back to the show. Hey, Buck. Glad so, to be your non-accredited yeah. guinea pig here. Yeah, you're the non-accredited guinea pig, although you are, you know, you're still a, an engineer and you still make a good amount of money. You just haven't hit that threshold of uh, $200,000 per year or a net worth of $1 million as uh, defined by the SEC. But there's plenty of options, right, Lane? So tell me. So you are the guy, when I decided I wanted to do a sh show about turnkey rentals, I thought, gosh, who, who do I know who's making money in turnkey rentals? And I thought Lane. So Lane, what is a turnkey rental, first of all? So a turnkey rental is a property, usually out of state, because a lot of us live on the West Coast or the East Coast where the rent to value ratios just don't make sense. So these turnkey homes are done by these re rehabbers in these secondary markets. They do all the rehab, such as the roof, the floors, the plumbing, the electrical, and they get it ready for us and they sell it to us at a retail price. But when we leverage the investment property, it comes out to be a pretty good overall investment and it's pretty passive. So where, where are you investing and why? Currently, I'm in Birmingham, Atlanta and Indianapolis. You know, there's a handful of these secondary markets that we always like to go to. I. I just kind of copy what all the other investors that I've been meeting have been going. And it's more important to kind of find the right team to help you find the right property that it's not a blighted property or in the wrong neighborhood. Actually, that's a very good point. And, you know, I have uh, in many ways taken that same path when it comes to my own investments. Let somebody else be the guinea pig, right? That's kind of why I tagged you for this show, because you are sort of the guinea pig for turnkey rentals. Now, how many houses do you currently own? And how much can, if you can give us an idea of how much cash flow that's resulted in? So I currently own 10, and I usually go after the little higher grade turnkey rentals, the more B class properties. So they usually average about $100,000 each. And I'll usually get anywhere from $200 to $300 conservatively a cash flow. Mm -hmm. That's after so you're all the using expenses. leverage. You're using That's leverage. Correct. So what's the average down payment for each house? Uh, you know, with twenty to twenty-five percent down, okay. and you know, it's a little extra cost for closing costs. You're looking anywhere from like twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand dollars per one of these. You know, better B-class rentals. When you say B-class, what do you mean by that? Just for for our audience doesn't know what that means. So there's different classes of properties. A are the kind of places that. I guess you probably live in an A-class, I'm guessing, Buck. I might live in an A-minus-class property. You know, these are the nice places where everybody wants to live. The rent-to-value ratios are such that you don't really get any cash flow, or it's not that good of a cash-flowing investment. And then the class below there is B-class, and that's where a lot of blue-collared uh, folks are, are living in. You get a little better cash flow, and then a grade below that, you have C-class, which is a mix of some blue collared and some people who are kind of in and out of work. And then of course there's D and F and we don't really want to is even there, go there. Is there a, I've never heard of an F class, <laughs> but you know, D class of course is uh, in my view, just don't do it. It's uh, the D class is where you've got people who've got, you know, no money, no credit. And you know, it's uh it's hit or miss. And I've lost a lot of money in my one um, apartment building that I did uh, D class. So here's the deal. I knew that Lane uh, had become sort of the turnkey guy. So I asked him for a referral to speak with, you know, what's called a turnkey provider, which is just a fancy way of saying somebody who's running a business where they, we set up investors like this. And so then he told me that he was actually working with one of these companies that he actually started out 
you know, buying properties from. So he's working as a sales agent. And um, so when we come back, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to uh, Jonathan Mednick, who's the co-founder of a company called REITrader.com, and he's going to tell us all about that. As a lot of investors know, multifamily real estate has been one of the best asset classes to be invested in most of the last decade. While the great deals have been harder to find lately, there are still opportunities in select markets where savvy investors can get lots of appreciation and strong cash flow if you have a great team. Dave Zook, founder and president of The Real Asset Investor, and his team have been very active in the multifamily space in Memphis, Tennessee. On the heels of the Great Recession of 2009, Dave and his team quietly started acquiring multifamily assets, and in the last few years, he has syndicated over 2,000 apartment units, creating strong cash flow streams and big appreciation for lots of their investors. It's not too late to get involved. If you're an accredited investor and you would like to learn more about investing in great multifamily apartments with a world-class team, email Dave and his team at info at therealassetinvestor.com. Welcome back, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey again with the Wealth Formula Podcast and coming back to this show about turnkey rentals. We turn now to Jonathan Mednick, who is a co-founder of REITrader.com. He's also the broker of uh, Real Equity, Inc., which handles acquisitions and sales for uh, Alabama investment properties. And he's done that since 2001, um, where he's been buying, selling, offering turnkey services, et cetera, to hundreds of investors throughout the U.S. So welcome, Jonathan. Hi, Buck. Happy to be here. Great. Now, so what is REITrader.com? REI Trader is a uh, investment platform that allows investors across the country and around the world to be able to purchase individual properties, whether they're wholesale or turnkey properties in various markets. Right now, we're in about 20 markets. Uh, we've tried to streamline the process, make it simple, and it gives a lot of these investors the opportunity to buy properties in those classes that you've already uh, previously mentioned. What markets are we talking about and what are your favorites? Well, we're primarily in a second tier markets, as Lane mentioned earlier, the cash flow uh, returns are much higher than in the major markets like Seattle. So that includes Birmingham, where I'm located, uh, Indianapolis, Kansas City, St. Louis, Cleveland, Chicago, Memphis. These are all very good uh, secondary markets. In terms of my favorite, obviously, I'm partial to Birmingham uh, just because of the warm uh, winters that we have here. Uh, so there's a decreased cost in winterizing properties. Just out of curiosity, isn't there issues that come from being in a warmer climate like Birmingham that are unique to that? I'm, I'm just curious because I don't, I don't have right now any property in that area, but in the southeast basically, you know, issues with mold, et cetera, nothing unique to it there. Well, you're going to have some issues with mold uh, as long as it's remediated properly uh, when the house is renovated and it's properly ventilated and insulated. That is very minimal compared to the high cost one would need to incur when trying to winterize a house in, in Chicago or Cleveland or, or, or Indianapolis. Now, tell me about it. So, so what <laughs> says, you know, I live in Chicago in uh, what Lane would characterize as class A, although I don't know if I would, it's characterized as class A because my house is about 70 years old and I think you have to be brand, pretty brand new to be a class A house. But at any rate, um, now, okay. So say I, Jonathan, I'm a, I'm an investor. Okay. This is, I want, I want to try to get a really good sense of how this works because, you know, I skip straight to apartment buildings for a variety of reasons, but a lot of people out there are thinking, you know what, I want to try something like this. I don't really want to deal with, you know, toilets and tenants and termites and all that stuff that people think of as real estate. So what's the first thing they do if you might be interested in buying a home in Alabama with a turnkey type setup? Right. So what we've endeavored to do is take the heavy lifting out, out of purchasing a turnkey property. Investors that would contact Lane and Lane would walk them through uh, REI Trader. They would choose Birmingham and they look at various properties. There's the details, there's photos, there's even a financial calculator. They can plug in, for example, their down payment to help them understand what kind of returns they're going to get. 
They select their properties, and then it's really no different than a normal closing that one would go through. Once a property is selected, it goes to uh, the closing coordinator, and they assist with the investor from taking it from contract with the closing attorney or title company all the way through closing. Uh, It's really a fairly simple process. Typically, I'd say 50% of our investors are going to pay cash. Uh, the others will finance. And if you're going to finance, you're looking at around a 45-day turnaround period. So your role pretty much is to identify the property. Are you actually renovating these properties or anything like that? What What else are you involved with with regard to the property itself? Are you, or are you just strictly finding good rentals and then making sure that the rest of the process goes? We do both. Mm-hmm. We have our own portfolio of properties that, that we purchase and we renovate, we turn key, and then we turn around and sell to our investor base, like what we've done with Lane. And then we have other investors where uh, they offer their properties through REI Trader, and there's a certification process if an investor does choose that property to make sure that it meets our requirements. And if it does, then we recommend for the investor to you know um, make a move on that property and purchase it. Right. So, so then who manages, who manages the home? We use third party property management. A lot of turnkey providers, DKP for short, you'll find that many of them will offer just not only acquisitions, but renovations and property management combined. And to me, that's probably a little too much power, too much control over one roof. And we prefer to focus on the things that we're good at, lead property management to uh, the folks that and do it 100% of the time and nothing else, and also helps to avoid conflicts of interest. Right. Now, but in real estate, as you know, and I found this to be incredibly, incredibly important, the most important factor in profitability, maybe even more than the asset itself, is finding somebody who can keep it rented and make sure that the rents are optimized. So in effect, managing the manager, is that something that you do, or would that be something that a buyer would sort of, you know, have to take control of? Essentially, we try to uh, facilitate and assist the investors with transition of the property to their appropriate property management and to ensure that the rents are being paid and the tenants are, they have the ability to pay those rents. Uh, And that's pretty much super important in order to be able to get good quality tenants. Now, of course, if there's an issue uh, our investors could always come back to me and I'm always happy to light a fire. The management companies that we use, it's very strategic. They know we're bringing them a lot of properties. So uh, they want to make sure they bend over backwards to take care of our people. And if they don't, then you know they have the uh, possibility of losing future business. So it's in their best interest to make sure that they really take care of the investors we refer to them. Makes sense. I mean, I think certainly um, what you're saying is uh, you're going to make sure that that at least that initial rent is market. And the, you know, the proof in the pudding is, well, are you going to get returns on that or not? Right. So you're going to get the appropriate returns. But as an ongoing basis, um, you're probably not going to be able to be 100 percent hands off like you are not in any investment, whether that's even, you know, stocks, bonds and mutual funds, because you have to take a look at performance once in a while. And certainly sure. that's something that you'll notice if the rent starts falling or, or, you know, vacancies happen, et cetera. So can you give me an example? I know, you know, obviously no one likes to talk about the, the things that went wrong, but it's always good to know uh, a time when something didn't go well for an investor and maybe how you can avoid some of those things. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of people need to understand that uh, when you purchase a turnkey property, and even though you're using a provider and you've got good property management, it doesn't mean that you're completely hands off. So there are things that go wrong and things will go wrong and because there are a lot of moving parts to the process. Uh, for example, you know, typically rents are paid on the 20th or dispersed on the 20th of the month. So that gives the tenants you know, between the 1st and the 15th to get their rent payments in. So if a rent is late or if it comes past due and here comes the 20th and then you don't get your rent check, then you're contacting property management and asking, well, what happened to my rent check? Well, they haven't yet paid it. Well, why wasn't I notified until, you know, like the third or fifth of the month instead of the 20th? Because they never know because they give it, they give a a grace period to give till the 20th of the month. 
in order to get the rents in order to disperse them. So that's kind of one example. So you're kind of behind the curve in terms of, you know, possibly notifying that tenant with a three-day notice to quit uh, or pay rent. Another example could be, you know, which is very important, you know, I was at a property today that I was certifying for a client and investor was really wanting to purchase his property. Um, so when I interviewed a tenant, I find, I find out that, you know, well, she's moving out at the end of the year. Well, last thing we want to do is sell a property to an investor to find out that, you know, two weeks later, the tenant's going to move out. That actually did happen a few months ago with one of our investors uh, where she did purchase a property and tenant did not notify us. And within a week after purchase, uh, the tenant did vacate and it's been about two months since that tenant is vacated. And, you know, now she's got to put some work into the property, painting, uh, some minor work, a few thousand dollars, and then work with property management to get it re-rented. So there are a couple of things that do happen and we try to minimize that as much as possible, but it happens. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is also, this is just reality and people look at their portfolios uh, in the stock market and they go down by 10% one day and then they go back up and they don't think twice about it. And the reality is this is that you have to look at this as the same way. I mean, sometimes you have setbacks, but in these cases you can actually explain why, you know, somebody moved out, well, you got to find somebody else to live there. It's not like you had some crazy volatility in the market and you suddenly lost all this money and, and you had no idea, you know, why that happened. So these are the kinds of things that happen when you have real, real assets. The one way certainly to hedge against that is to accumulate them. And for me, I mean, that, that world is in apartment buildings. But of course, as we talked about it at the beginning of the show, not everybody can go that route or wants to go that route initially. So it's an opportunity to get your foot in the door and get some positive cash flow and try to get some help along the way. Now, there are, as um, Lane kind of alluded to earlier, there are different classes of homes in general, and you deal with different classes of homes. Can you explain for us why someone might choose one class or the other and what kinds of returns that, that you might expect and perhaps a strategy? There are two classes of uh, properties we primarily focus on, B and C class. Now, the B class properties are typically, uh, at least for Birmingham, is going to be in the eighty-five dollars to $150,000 range. You're going to have a higher quality tenant who has a, a stable job, primarily white color. The rents are going to be anywhere from $900 to $1,500 a month. You're going to get slightly less returns because it is a safer asset in terms of the quality of the area and the tenants that are residing in the property. But you're going to get a, a somewhat appreciation over a period of time, let's say, you know, a, a five to seven year period. So those are really good assets. A lot of our West Coast buyers like those returns. And typically you're going to get on a cash and cash return. You're going to get um, typically in the 10 percent, 12 percent range. Is that with uh, leverage or without? Cash. Yes, with leverage. That's uh -huh. with leverage. OK, then. Uh, and, and, it, and it's really more of a, a, a safe investment. Now, the C-class properties are going to range in anywhere from $45,000 to $80,000. The rents are going to be from seven fifty dollars to about $1,000. Um, you're going to get lower end, lower income folks, um, a Section 8 tenants, which I like. I have a lot of my C-class properties. I even have D-class properties that are, are Section 8. And I do like Section 8 because you never have to chase them for the rent. Uh, which is a good thing. Can you can you um, real but, quick for people who are not necessarily that into real estate just explain in a couple sentences what Section Eight is? It's state subsidized rent. That's essentially it. So if the rent is, for example, I have one tenant, the total rent is nine hundred a month. The state pays nine hundred one. I'm sorry, it's nine fifty a month. State pays nine hundred one, and she pays forty nine dollars a month. So every month I get forty nine dollars, and the rest the state does a direct deposit in my account. It's it's a great thing. It's how tax dollars at work. Okay, now that we have that Section 8 part cleared up, tell me more about those properties. I love C-class properties, and for a couple of reasons. You're going to get a higher risk, but with higher risk comes higher reward. So it's not uncommon 
for cash on cash returns for your returns to be anywhere from 15 to 18 percent. Now that's um, with or without leverage there? That is with leverage. With leverage, okay. Um, or, or, or more. Um, is it hard to get it, loans on? Uh, is it hard to get loans on those? Typically, if it's under $60,000, the banks are going to shy away from it. There are individual lenders and uh, who approach us on a weekly uh, basis who obviously want our investors' business. So uh, there's the opportunity to warehouse a loan, meaning you combine multiple mortgages or multiple properties under one mortgage um, to meet the minimum threshold. Some of them, you know, will do a sixty thousand. Others are at eighty-five or ninety thousand dollars minimum. So it just really depends on the lenders. But you know, we have sufficient number of lenders who, you know, could assist the investor in, in deciding, you know, you know, which lender to go with. Do you, do you have any investors who've uh, accumulated, say, 10, 20 of these? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, what's really important about what we do is we look at every relationship uh, strategically, whether they purchase one a year or 10 a year. It's really important that, you know, we find them the, the right investment, you know, just like the property today. You know, I could very well have told my investor to purchase this property, knowing full well that that tenant is vacating at the end of the year. But that's just not the way we operate. Uh, so most of our investors who work with us, they don't really work with any other, you know, TKPs. You know, Lane, for example, I mean, he's been a, not only a client of ours, but now he's a, a sales rep for us. Uh, so that kind of says a lot to our operation on, and uh, how we conduct business. So one of the thoughts that I had, and now I'm going to take a step away from the mom and pop investors and the first time people and think of, you know, think a little bit out of the box here, because if you're talking about 15 to 18 percent return on invest investment on these class C properties, you could, of course, you're going to be limited, first of all, by the number of, of loans that you can get because these are residential. And how many is that? It's 20 or so. Is that right? It really depends on their criteria and what they're looking for. Is it? No, I'm talking about in terms of the banks. Um, yeah. So, Buck, right oh, now, Fannie Mae yeah. is allowing you to get 10 in your name. And what a lot of people are doing is 10 in their spouse's name. They just need to make sure they get the loan and title in one person's name and not joint. Got it. Got it. But of course, this, you do have to buy it in your own name, which do you, uh, but then do you often find people putting them into LLCs anyway? So this uh, is uh, discussed a lot on a lot of podcasts. And what most of the sophisticated investors are doing is that they'll purchase it in their name, get the Fannie Mae loan, but then put it into LLC shortly after for asset protection. Just deed, uh, uh, deed it over. That's correct. Right. And, many, okay. and more times than not, the due on sale clause is never really invoked. So one of the thoughts I had on this was, of course, uh, taking it uh, to the next level. Now, if you're if you're out there and you're like me, you're looking for an opportunity and you, you start thinking 15, 18 percent, that's pretty darn good. Right. So what if I got 20 or 30 of these and then and then refi into a big commercial loan? That could be a real opportunity. Some of our investors actually do that. I have one investor who I probably in the last two years have sold them probably north of 75 houses. Right. Uh, and that's exactly what he does. He'll, he'll put them into a commercial loan of, he'll package them of 15 to 20 properties and they're all turnkey, they're all renovated, um, they're all occupied with property management and um, he gets a great return. He's actually buying three more houses from me this week. Wow. So does he typically start with cash or is he buying them? on loans and then accumulating them that way? Typically, a lot of the experienced investors mm -hmm. will pay cash and then get a finance um, down the road. Uh -huh. I mean, I always personally, you know, for myself, I buy cash and then I'll turn around and finance them uh, just because, you know, cash is king and, and it's easier to negotiate a better price with a seller. If you're going to come to the table with cash, it can close in a couple of weeks versus taking 45 days. And so it's just a matter of personal preference. But, you know, there are a lot of our investors who um, will come to the table financing the property using a 401k or Roth IRA um, or a 1031 exchange, uh, which is fine as well. Uh, and it's about a 50-50 split yeah. between cash and finance. So, yeah, that's thinking a little bit on a, you know, higher, uh, higher scale. So there's an opportunity here for, I think, for, smaller investors and, and bigger investors as well. Yeah, for me, Buck, I wanted to maximize my Fannie Mae loans and 
lock those up because those, those are pretty sweet financing. So I raced to get my 10. And that kind of puts me in position for a lot of these syndication deals because now I'm I'm not accredited, but I can come in on the deal as a sophisticated investor. And because if you have a bunch of rentals, you're pretty sophisticated. Oh, is that is that right? I get okay. That makes sense. Is there like some sort of cutoff, or or is it just because you just have a lot of you know you just have a lot of houses? I think as as you know, it's kind of a gray area there, yeah. but you understand the risks of real estate and the investment, right? As you can tell, I'm learning with everybody else here. I don't know much about turnkey operators, but in preparation for the show, I did do a little research, and there's actually quite a few turnkey operators out there. And so, what do you? Th- what makes you guys unique? Well, for for myself, you know, what's different uh, or what's unique is that you know we're just not investors, but you know we also have a, a brokerage that runs in concert or in partnership with our turnkey operation. So the investor gets a benefit of all the wisdom from the investing side, but all the transparency and honesty one would get on the brokerage side. And and not many turnkey providers um, do offer that. Yeah, got it. The way I see it is there's a couple ways you can purchase turnkeys. The first is through a marketer, and those are the podcasters and the other random people in bigger pockets trying to bring you to a turnkey provider or you're going directly turnkey provider. But the problem there is you're signing their contracts. You have nobody representing you. So it's a little dangerous doing that. I guess what Jonathan has kind of built here is a, I call it the hybrid way, which is going, getting an agent on your behalf to kind of represent you. So you don't buy that wrong house on the block. Yeah. So the model basically, as I understand it, is that instead of, you know, instead of you getting, a cut of the the house or you're raising the price in the house and doing all this, you're effectively taking like a $3,000 per deal fee just for doing all of the due dil finding the property, doing all of the appropriate due diligence, et cetera. So you will have an upfront additional fee of $3,000, but that's sort of a finite thing. And so you really should get, uh, you know, you should really start to see, even better returns at uh, at year two, is that right? right? And correct. And and Lane brings up a very good point. When you're dealing with marketers, it's not uncommon that they'll take our inventory, which they've done, and they will mark it up seventy five to ten thousand dollars on top of that. And and that's simply you know a fee that they try to collect as a referral fee. What we endeavor to do, and we only represent buyers and sellers on our platform, uh, so it cuts out the middleman, it lowers the costs, and there's more price transparency. So the price that you see on REI Trader, that's the price you're going to pay, or or slightly less if we do a good job at negotiating the price down. Uh, that's a, a very important point. That's all really good stuff, guys. It's uh, been very educational. Now, Jonathan uh, has graciously offered to give our Wealth Formula audience a um, $250 discount off of that $3,000 fee. And uh, if you have an interest in that, um, email me at turnkey at wealthformula.com. That's T-U-R-N-K-E-Y, turnkey at wealthformula.com. Jonathan Lane, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Buck. Folks, this is about... You know, think about this. The barrier for entry in hard asset investing is not as high as you might have thought. You know, maybe this is the right way for you to get your feet wet with passive income investing. So as a reminder, we've also got a special report on www.wealthformula.com on legally reducing your taxes by thousands of dollars per week that you should download. You should also look at possibly getting a copy of George Newberry's book for free on the site and take advantage of all the resources we have there. Again, this was a great conversation today. And uh, until next week, this is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.